Now, finally, I am delighted to introduce a Canadian Muslim feminist and reformist. She's president of the Council of Muslims Facing Tomorrow, author of the book Their Jihad, Not My Jihad, journalist, activist for human rights and gender equality. She's accredited with the United Nations Human Rights Council and has received many awards for her work on women's equality. She is the first Muslim Canadian woman to lead mixed gender prayers for which she has received a death threat. She also runs a forum for learning for youth to educate them about the dangers of radicalization and terrorism. Please welcome Raheel Raza. Respected members of uh, Parliament and friends, uh, good morning. It is um, really an honor and a pleasure to be here today uh, and to see the work that is being done uh, for women's rights. Let me tell you a story about Canada. Sometime in the middle of a June night in 2009, Mohammed Shafia, an Afghan immigrant to Canada with the help of his eldest son and one of his two wives, put his three daughters aged 13, 17, and 19 and his first wife inside a car and pushed the car into the Rideau Canal where all four of them died. This was a murder committed in the name of honor. Shafia believed the daughters were too interested in boys, they were too immodest, too Western to live. And he believed that his first wife, Arona, was a bad influence on the girls. The community went into denial immediately. And many women's groups clamored to say that this should not be called honor killing, but that the murder, but we know that the murderer in this case and in many other cases used the word honor as the intention to explain why he did what he did. And this was something that was uh, groundbreaking in terms of their prosecution and their final uh, commitment. Now, this happened in Canada, but I'm sure this sounds familiar to many of you because you can relate to the stories of Fadime, of Pella, of the many other girls who have been victims of honor-based violence, plus, you know, thousands of others whose stories are never told and whose voices we have to be. The uh, important issue in all of this is that in many of these cases, in fact, in the majority of the cases, the victims gave out signals that all was not well and that they needed help, but they were ignored. The, uh, in, in the case of what the work that we do in Canada, we, under the uh, rubric of honor-based violence, we consider forced and underage marriage, honor killings, and female genital mutilation. Uh, female genital mutilation, by the way, is one of the most horrific acts and one of the largest issues in North America. And just very quickly, if I can share with you that in the United States alone, there are more than half a million cases of female genital mutilation. So you can understand why this is such a big issue. The reasons for honor-based violence are embedded in harmful cultural practices like policing women's behavior, patriarchal norms, controlling women's sexuality in particular, and the idea that honor can be reclaimed when blood is shed. Now, in the case of the Shafia murders, as I said, there were indicators that something was very wrong at home, and the girls had been speaking in school about the problems, and social services as well as the police were called more than once. But the problem was that they have no idea of the indicators of honor-based violence, so the girls time and again were told to go home. No one intervened, but at the end of all of this and when the final um, investigation was done, 
they just, they've said that this is something that could have been avoided if there had been better awareness of the problems. And the other thing that was put into play was political correctness and naivety on part of the law, law enforcement agencies, on part of the judicial system, and on part of the masses in general. I used to think that we in Canada are very naive. Uh, we are known to be uh, extremely polite, do not like any kind of conflict, and if you step on my foot, I'm the one who's going to say sorry. But in this case, that naivety has probably caused uh, many lives to go, and that is something that we can't afford to do. There are specific signs and indicators of honor-based violence. Uh, there are definitions of honor-based violence, and that is why it's extremely important that we create the awareness and that we put aside, uh, we put aside political correctness. Now, uh, the Shafia, uh, the Muhammad Shafia, was convicted finally because an expert witness was called in, a professor who came and explained to the justice system and to the court exactly what honor-based violence is. And it, but now, uh, just a few months ago, they are contesting the testimony of that expert witness. Therefore, we need more people who are aware of what this, these issues are. Now, you may wonder why honor-based violence is such a severe crisis. I mean, there are murders, there are all sorts of violence against women all over the world. But we need urgent change, not just from the grassroots up like these wonderful women before me who were speaking and Sarah Mohammed. We also need to have the, the laws in place. We need our governments to work from the top down. And I'll uh, tell you why this is so important globally. This is a global crisis. In a poll conducted by the Pew Research Center that was titled The World's Muslims, Religion, Politics, and Society, it was found that an average of 39% of Muslims surveyed think that it is often or sometimes justified to kill a woman if she engages in premarital sex or adultery. Even if you take a wild guess to how many numbers this is, it translates into 345 million people who believe that it is justified to kill a woman. This is a horrific number. And this is growing because we are not waking up to the fact that honor-based violence is not just happening out there. It's happening in North America, it's happening in the United Kingdom, it's happening right here in Europe, and of course in Sweden. Now the numbers are very hard to follow because we don't have so many statistics. But let me very quickly share with you that in, in countries like Jordan, the numbers of uh, uh, honor killings are extremely high. Uh, even in a study of honor killings in Egypt, 47% of the women were killed by a relative after the woman had been raped. In Jordan and Lebanon, 70 to 75% of the perpetrators of these honor killings are the women's brothers. Now, the shocking part is that Article 340 of the Jordan Penal Code states that he who discovers his wife or one of his female relatives committing adultery and kills, wounds, or injures one of them is exempted from any penalty. In Pakistan, where I come from, there are 800 recorded honor killings in a year. Now, these are just the recorded ones. The ones that are not recorded, we don't know about. But we live in secular democracies where we must expose the problem, we must educate the masses, and we must eliminate the problem. I'm not a legal expert, but I know in the work that I do with the victims that what we have to keep in mind is the stories, the lives of the victims. And this is why I feel so honored to be here as we commemorate Fadim and Pella and all the millions of women who have been killed in honor-based honor violence. As a, a human rights activist accredited to the United Nations, I, for years I have been trying to compel the United Nations to make honor killings a criminal offense internationally, which it is not. It needs to be made an international criminal offense just like you have murder, number one. And this is where law enforcement and governments need to take note. Um, 
you've heard my previous speakers speak about the legal implications, but let me give you a very grassroots example of how this works. If a girl in Canada calls the police and says, I think I'm going to be forced by my family to go back to my home country and be married, the police can't take any action because a crime has not been committed. And this is why it's so important to educate the law enforcement agencies and the judicial system to understand the indicators of honor-based violence. This is it's why it's so important to have honor-based violence or honor-based abuse as a separate code because it is not domestic violence. Very often, and uh, this is unfortunate that some of our feminist groups and people who are politically correct, get into a discussion about whether it should be called honor or whether it should be called uh, domestic violence. In the meantime, we are speaking of people who have lost their lives. We have um, the, the child abuse is considered a criminal offense. Murder in the first degree is a criminal offense. So when you see girls as young as nine being married, forced into a marriage, and you see girls very, very young being forced to have female genital mutilation, why should not that be a criminal offense? And this is something that is a huge issue about making honor-based violence into a criminal offense. In Phoenix, Arizona, a young girl by the name of Noor al-Malki was murdered by her father. And although he was prosecuted, he was not prosecuted for, he was not given a first degree murder conviction. And in, in uh, 23 states in the United States, female genital mutilation is illegal, but there has only been one prosecution when you have about half a million cases of female genital mutilation. So what we did in Canada is that we um, sent every member of parliament a copy of Honor Diaries, the film that you're going to see in a little while, which gives you statistics and which actually identifies the three areas that come under honor-based violence. And based on this and giving testimony to government, they called us time and again to say, is this really happening? Can you give us examples? Can you bring the victims? Now, we've heard that it's very hard to bring victims of honor-based violence to come and speak in parliament because they're afraid for their lives, but we managed to take some victims. They heard their stories. And in June last year, we passed a bill called Bill S7, which says zero tolerance for barbaric practices. It's now a criminal offense for parents, for teachers, for anyone who is involved and knows that there is going to be a forced marriage or female genital mutilation. However, as um, Elizabeth said, I think it's important to see the convictions. It's very well to have a bill that's not enough. So we suggested to government that along with this bill that has been passed, there need to be public services messages for the communities because we come back to our mandate of the three E's. When we expose the problem, we need to educate the masses in every language of which the immigrant communities that live there so that they can understand that they have recourse to these actions. So a lot of material, a lot, lot of marketing of the concept that this bill does exist. And then we have to speak about the law enforcement agencies eradicating uh, the problem. So, uh, you know, essentially our tagline for this is that culture is no, no excuse for abuse. We recommend very, very much to governments all over the world not to be politically correct because abuse cannot be dealt with political correctness. It is beyond culture, religion, ethnicity. Human rights abuse needs to be directly handled. And we must also remember that all cultures are not equal. This does not mean that there is one that is good or bad, but we have to get over that knee-jerk reaction for cultural relativism. We must understand that a culture in which women are killed is not the same as a culture that respects its women. So with this, I will end my words, and uh, thank you for having me. Um. Thank you so much for this. I, I would like to open with a, a very burning question, if you don't mind. Sure. Now, uh, you just said that uh, honor oppression is beyond ethnicity, culture, and religion. 
uh, by which I assume you mean that it occurs in all cultural and religious contexts. It's not specific to, to one religion or culture. Is that what you meant to say? Yes, honor-based uh, honor violence does exist in uh, many cultures. Right. It exists in South Asian societies, but it is also statistically found more in Muslim majority societies. Right. Um, so my question is, what, what is the role, really, of religion in the honor system, in the norms and practices associated with this concept of, of honor? I know it's a very broad question, but it's also a much debated one. And since I know that you yourself are, are a believer, I, yes. I would very much like to ask you this. I don't believe that, well, I am a believer, but I don't believe that any faith at its core, in its spiritual message, asks for violence against another human being. That is my belief. However, for centuries, religion has been misused by people of all ilks to promote subversive agendas. And in the case of Muslim majority societies, because I am a Muslim woman fighting from within the faith for reform and change, it is uh, man-made laws known as Sharia laws. We heard Diana speak about Sharia courts in, in England. It is through secondary commentary. It is through the politicization of the faith. And more importantly, it is because of power, patriarchy, and politics mm -hmm. used under the disguise of religion to promote these, uh, these habits. So, and it's done in a very subtle way. So while you would not have a religious leader, for example, saying, you must kill this woman, there are ways of saying that it is dishonorable and the honor of the family must be somehow redeemed and that they understand to mean that it means taking blood. Now, I should also mention for the sake of the audience that honor killings are a very, very old tribal practice. They have existed since before religion. But many communities were able to move ahead to modern times, to the 21st century, and say that this is not something we need to do now. You know, it's not something that, that exists today. Unfortunately, there are other societies in which it still continues mm -hmm. because the judicial system, the, the, the outlying community, and everyone looks the other way. And, you know, this is the idea, this is a ghettoization of that community. Well, it's their cultural practice, and nobody wants to speak out. So it, it's quite a complex uh, issue, obviously. But, uh, so, you're obviously a, a very liberal Muslim. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> too too uh, liberal for some people. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can kind of imagine what you mean. Now, uh, so, so your interpretation of, of Islam, uh, as, as you say, is, is not the majority's version, not the, the dominant version in Muslim-majority societies of today. What, what do you think it will take to implement, to, to, to make Muslim-majority societies embrace your views and your liberal, liberal, liberal outlook on religion? Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it will take time. Uh, if we look at other faith communities, for example, the Christian reform, you know, it was not something that happened overnight. No reform happens overnight. But we need to sow the seeds of change. So we have actually implemented a reform movement. It's called the Muslim Reform Movement. Right. Tell which, us a bit about that. Yes. So um, just very recently, in the beginning of December, about 14 organizations and individuals got together in Washington, D.C., and we signed off on a declaration called the Muslim Reform Movement. There is a Facebook page for it, plus a website, just muslimreformmovement.org. And uh, in this group, there were men, women, and two imams. And we decided that we need to uh, look at bringing our, in our understanding and interpretation of Islam into the 21st century, and one of the most important factors in that, along with governance and um, 
uh, working with society is gender equality and to, to make sure that this balance of gender equality and the taking out violence from any kind of interpretation of an understanding of Islam. So we signed off on this declaration. We had a press conference at the National Press Club, Club in Washington. And our first act of defiance was to go to the Saudi-funded mosque in Washington, D.C. and pin the declaration to their door under the threat of being arrested, of calling the police. And then uh, the men, my husband who is here, was helping us in this. He pinned the declaration. And then three women went and prayed in the main section of the mosque. That has never happened in the history of the Saudi-funded mosque. So it was a bit of shock to them. I don't think they've gotten over it yet. So what happened? But how did well, they actually react? Well, what happened was that the men engaged these guards, these huge, bulky, six-foot guards who kept saying, we're going to call the police. This has never happened. No, sister, you can't go and pray in the main section. We go to the women's section. And we said, no. This is a place of prayer for men and women in the Prophet's Mosque. 1,400 years ago, men and women prayed side by side. We are not asking to lead prayers. We just want to reclaim our original rights. And he, they went to pick up the phone, and I said to my two friends, let's just quickly start praying. They can't arrest us while we are praying. So we went into the main section. We were properly dressed, head covered, and all of that. And we prayed, and we got a picture of that. Wow. And they were just sort of left blustering. Uh, as I said, they're probably going to put locks on the door now. But we did it. And this was just a step for, for gender equality to instill that we are equal, because that is what God wanted originally, is from, you know, spiritually for men and women to be equal. So it's not that it is an aggressive movement. We have a lot of um, very strong um, uh, language in our uh, declaration, which, as I said, is on my website at, at Muslims Facing Tomorrow on their website, where we say that the concept of armed jihad, which was a seventh century concept, and it existed because there were no uh, nation states, there were no boundaries, these were tribal communities. We say, leave it in the seventh century, denounce it openly, and let's live a life of peace, tolerance, equality, and understanding with each other. Now, you have said that you believe that change has to come from within yes. the Muslim community. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Why is that? <clears throat> that is because if you said what I have just said, you'll be called a racist. And right. we've, we've heard this right. over and over again. This idea that anybody who is from outside the circle of the Muslim world, if they criticize uh, anything uh, terrible that is happening, even honor killings uh, that is happening, say, by Muslim men, they will be called racist. And they will be called Islamophobes. And this Islamophobia industry has been marketed on the backs of billions of petrodollars so that politicians, so that people who are not part of the community will be silenced and they will be afraid to speak out. And unfortunately, a large part of the non-Muslim world has bought into this. They are terrified of being called racist. And if you see the one hour version of the film on a diaries, you will hear me say that don't be afraid to be even called a racist because you know that you're not if you're criticizing some things that's right. That's right, because in your fear of being called a racist, someone's life may go. So how is it that we can sit back and look at the statistics? How is it that we are here in this room today and we are commemorating the lives of these girls? Who could have been here with us? I would say that it's political correctness that took their life. I would say that it's lack of understanding and sensitivity for this that took their lives. I would say that their life should not have been taken in vain. What we need to do is build from that, take it from an example, and never, ever be afraid to speak the truth, no matter what the labels are. Uh, and, and so the fight from within the Muslim world is so that they can't slap me with a label of Islamophobia. So I need to be the frontline warrior in this battle and have support of everyone else because we can't do it alone. But I have always said that Muslims are the frontline warriors in this battle against a radical Islamist ideology, which is what feeds the violence against women. As there is a rise in a radical Islamist ideology, and I'm afraid to say that I've seen it exist here in Europe as well, very much so. And we should be talking about this at 
every government meeting. Why did the issue happen in Cologne in Germany on New Year's night? Nobody wants to go into the minute details of why it happened. Is there some sort of um, uh, mandate out there? Do you know that I have been sent emails from people in Canada telling me that you are in Sweden. Please make sure that the lawmakers there, the government understands that there is a concentrated effort. There are young women, uh, white women being raped. There are Swedish women who are being assaulted and insulted. And this is all part of a, a sort of an Islamist campaign. But I'm afraid nobody wants to talk about it. So I am. <laughs> But can I ask you then, because this is extremely interesting, I think, how can a person be empowered from within in the way that you have been? You have questioned your inherited tradition, and you have said that uh, even when, when you were a child, a very young girl, you, you actually uh, questioned and, and, and tried to find new approaches to your faith. You grew up in a context where women were told to be seen and not heard. You were told not to ask too many questions, not to talk too much and you're saying that you did exactly the opposite. Yes. I think that's highly impressive, and I'm wondering how do you think that a person, uh, how did this happen for you, and what lessons can be drawn by others from that? Well, it's a journey. It's a journey, and it's not an easy journey. It's very challenging. I have heard uh, Rashid talk about, uh, you know, how your family uh, move so you distances themselves from you. Uh, it takes a lot of sacrifices, and in my case, I am particularly gifted because I have support uh, from the people around me, from my immediate family and, and my children. But uh, it, th there are always roadblocks, and I just decided that for me, the most important thing is not to be popular, but to be truthful and speak with justice about what's happening in the world. And as a Muslim woman, as a mother and a grandmother, I can't sleep at night if I thought I was not doing my bit to bring about change. And as I said before, I don't anticipate that this is a change that will come overnight. But every movement, every reform began with women like Sarah Muhammad standing up and speaking out against the establishment. And we are going uphill against the flow. Uh, it just uh, make, inspires me so much to see all these wonderful young women because this is the next generation that's going to carry the banner. And let me also remind you that this change, this reform, is on the shoulders and in the hands of the women who are going to do this. They are going to make it happen because women are by nature nurturers. And we are the mothers who teach our children either to become suicide bombers or to be good human beings. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of stress that needs to be put in, in supporting these women who are speaking out. But regardless of that, there need to be men involved in we as well. We can't do this alone. So we need men, women, everyone, Muslim, non-Muslim, everyone involved in this uh, battle, which I call for global peace, for gender equality, so that we can all wake up in the morning and have a wonderful day. Very well. We will be rounding this off now. Uh, just one final question, because as you said, we will see uh, this documentary in which you participated, Honor Diaries, after, when we come back after a short break here. Uh, and this film features nine women's rights activists with connections to Muslim-majority societies who are trying, like yourself, to affect change. So just tell us, please, something br briefly about the making of this film. What was your vision? What were you hoping to achieve by this work? Well, this film was a groundbreaking film in terms of the three E's that I spoke about, to expose the problem, educate the masses, and eventually a call to action to eradicate the problem of honor-based violence. What you will see in this film is something that people are very unaware of. And so when we speak of honor-based violence, a lot of people have this question in their mind. What exactly is it? What does it mean? How prevalent is it? Why should I, as an ordinary uh, office-going person, nine to five, not involved in this community, why should I care? And when you see this film, you understand the tagline is that culture is no excuse for abuse. And when you see the film, I think that there is not a single person who won't be touched by it. You know, it's something that touches you deeply to your soul, and you can't go away without thinking, there's something I want to do. 
to help this cause and to bring about change. There's a call to action there as well. And this film, by the way, has been screened across the globe in thousands of locations. It has had, it has an Arabic Facebook page which has had more than half a million likes. It has been wow. screened in Muslim majority societies as well, where the problem is very prevalent. And it wasn't banned or in any well, way? Well, it was not banned uh, in the sense that it wasn't in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Algeria, in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. It was screened privately in, in people's homes. I but see. I did Skype interviews with them through an Arabic translator, which I can tell you was quite a joyous uh, experience. <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say is that it has caught people's attention. It has exposed the problem. And that is the first part of any problem is to diagnose the disease and then find a, a, a cure for it. Right. Uh, for many in the Western world, they have not even diagnosed the disease yet. And I uh, you know, invite them into our circle to say, understand the problem, please, and help us find the solutions. We are very fortunate that you are helping us to, to diagnose the problem. Thank you so very much. And we are looking forward to seeing this film now. Thank you. Thank you. Pushing me over the edge A thousand reflections in my mind That I want you to see How did I let myself fall into this trap My soul feels so empty right now But I won't keep silent About the silence And all my eyes see is the busy street all noise and I'm not hearing anything but when you lose yourself in the depths of your sorrow free yourself from all the pain and break out of praise and fight through anything and if you let yourself go and hold your head up your strongest soon you'll find the happiness and it will shine through your smile when you free yourself when you're free 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 when free when you're free when you're free when you're free you could hold me in your arms hypnotized by the words and the echoing repeatedly in my brain and i could hold you in my arms i would run